Hello everyone, welcome to A plus BI. This channel is all about complex numbers and in this video we're going to be solving a problem that was kind of suggested by one of my viewers, a great commenter, a great mathematician, very knowledgeable person, Nadia Fan, because I made a video on my other channel which is CyberMath about something like this. It was, I think, x plus one over x is equal to two cosine alpha. And then you're supposed to evaluate x cubed plus one over x cubed in terms of alpha. And you could find it using the same idea that we're gonna talk about today, but I'm gonna be adding a little bit of um, different things that were inspired by Nadia Fan. Again, thank you for the inspiration. All right, let's continue. Now, we're gonna go ahead and take a look and by the way the other video I made on February 5th if you want to check it out it's at CyberMath. okay so we're gonna be looking at it from two different angles let's go ahead and start with the first method so for my first method first of all I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the value of cosine theta if theta is real then cosine theta is always going to be between negative 1 and 1 inclusive, right? And from here I can do something. Multiply both sides by 2. And then notice that 2 cosine theta is equal to z plus 1 over z. So let's go ahead and replace this with z plus 1 over z. And we'll get a system of inequalities. Because we can kind of look at this inequality as this and this makes sense that's what we kind of ne need an intersection here in other words makes sense so we're going to look at it first this one z plus one over z must be greater or equal to negative two and then i'm going to look at and the other one makes sense okay good now you don't want to multiply both sides by z because that would make an assumption about z being positive instead let's put everything on the same side so add two to both sides, great, we got zero on one side. And then you can kind of make a common denominator. That would be z squared plus two z, or not two z, plus one, divided by z, greater or equal to zero. And notice that the top, the numerator, is a perfect square. And now we're gonna go ahead and make a quick table. Tables are good because that kind of allow you to solve these kinds of inequalities. I can actually make a table with one row or two rows, if you count the zero. Uh, and it's going to be the solutions are going to be negative 1 and 0, but negative 1 is a double solution. I'm going to put two lines. It's kind of like, this is called a method of intervals, I think, and I'll put a um, little 0 here, meaning that the sign is going to change at 0, right? If z is positive, we get a positive denominator, otherwise it's a negative denominator. But if you look at the overall, like the whole thing, if z is greater than 0, obviously this is going to be positive. So I'm going to start with plus sign, then a minus sign. And on the double lines, the sign is not going to change. Make sense? That's why I put the double lines, to remind myself. I want this whole thing to be positive or greater than or equal to 0. So I want z to be greater than or equal to 0 or is greater than 0. Yes, z must be greater than 0. Because if z is 0, it's undefined. So from here, I get z must be greater than 0. Now let's go ahead and solve this part. z plus one over z is less than or equal to two. Let's go ahead and put everything on the same side. Again, same idea. Make a common denominator and solve this inequality using method of intervals. This is z minus one squared over z, very similar to the first one. And now on our table, we're gonna have z, zero, and one here, and this time, the double root is going to be at 1 because we have z minus 1 squared, right? That's repeated. And we're going to start with a positive sign again because if z is greater than 1, we have a positive quantity. It's not going to change here. And then we're going to get a negative quantity here. Makes sense? Oops, I forgot to put my little circle there. And obviously, I do want the minus sign because I want this expression to be less than or equal to 0. Right? But z, again, cannot be 0. So this means... I want this interval, so z must be less than zero. Uh-oh, that's interesting because first part gave me z is greater than zero, second part gave me that. So if you put these two together, z is greater than zero and z is less than zero. Wait a minute, is that possible? No, 
It's not possible. Therefore, Z cannot be real. Okay, that was kind of like a very long and convoluted way to find out, but I just wanted to introduce this method, being inspired by the trigonometric approach. Anyways, maybe I took it wrong, the wrong way. But Z is not real, therefore it needs to be complex, right? Let's take a look. Now, we have Z plus 1 over Z equals 2 cosine theta. Now, if you try to solve this using the quadratic formula, you get Z squared minus 2 cosine theta multiplied by Z plus 1 equals 0. And if you don't see that this is actually quadratic in Z, you can go ahead and look at it this way. Hopefully, it'll make more sense. Notice that this is quadratic in Z. So we can use the quadratic formula, which is negative B plus minus the square root of B squared, which is 4 cosine squared theta minus 4AC, which is 4. And then if you subtract it, if you subtract it, well, I can take the 4 out. And that's going to give me cosine squared theta minus 1. 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared, so this is the opposite of sine squared, which is negative sine squared. But if you square root that, you're going to get complex solutions or non-real solutions. You're going to get the i, right? So z will be 2 cosine theta plus minus 2 sine theta times i. I could also write the i first, no big deal. But multiplying everything by 1 half or dividing by 2, gives you the following, z equals cosine theta plus minus i times sine theta. Awesome. <laughs> Wait a minute. What are we looking for? z. So those are the solutions. You could also write z as e to the power plus minus i theta, right? Because cosine is even, so cosine of negative theta will be cosine of theta. Make sense? Okay, I hope it does now. Let's go ahead and take a look at the second method. It's interesting because it uses the standard form or the rectangular form. Now we're going to go ahead and replace z with a plus bi. What is 1 over z going to be from here? Well, why do I, I had to use this method. You know why? Because this channel is called a plus bi. It's going to be the service if I don't use this. 1 over z is just the reciprocal of this, but I got to use the conjugate. So let's multiply by a minus bi's. And that's going to give me 1 over z as a minus bi divided by a squared plus b squared. Remember, if you multiply two conjugates, you always get a real number. Sum of two squares. Never, ever forget that. Now we're going to put these two together. How nice. a plus bi plus a minus bi divided by a squared plus b squared is equal to 2 cosine theta, which is real. So I should not have an imaginary part. Let's separate these a plus a over a squared plus b squared plus b minus b over a squared plus b squared. All of that is multiplied by i, and this equals 2 cosine theta. But there is no i on the right-hand side, so the coefficient of i, which is the imaginary part, must be 0. Awesome. I can actually factor out a b here and write this as follows. If b is 0, then z will be real. But we know it's impossible, right? We already talked about it. Come on, that was a lengthy discussion. So this must be 0 then, since this is non-zero. And that means a squared plus b squared is equal to 1, which means the modulus of my complex number. Remember, z was equal to a plus pi. It's supposed to be, the modulus is supposed to be 1. What does that mean though, right? Well, it just means that z can be written as e to the power i theta or i alpha, right? Actually, I can't use theta because I don't know what it is, but I can write it as follows, or cosine alpha plus i sine alpha. Let's go ahead and do this. z plus 1 over z. Now, if z is this, then it's going to be cosine alpha plus i sine alpha. And now 1 over z is just going to be the reciprocal, but in this case, it's also going to be the conjugate, cosine alpha minus i sine alpha. And the imaginary parts cancel out. Uh-oh, we get 2 cosine alpha. But that's supposed to be 2 cosine theta, which means alpha is theta. Of course, it's not the only result. We'll talk about it. But this tells you that either alpha is theta or alpha is the opposite of theta. Or you can also write it as 2 pi minus theta, same idea. And we get the same solutions. Make sense? And now let's go ahead and take a look at what Wolfram Alpha has to say. Yes, 
if you look at it this way, which is obviously what it is 2 cosine theta is, we use the trigonometric uh, form for, you know, Euler's formula, in other words. And yes, it's kind of easy to see that z must be one of these, right? And then, I don't know what these are. What is this? Kind of garbage, right? Anyways, must have a meaning, right? And then at the end, we get the solutions as before. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.